My name is Mike Jensen. I'm the chairman of the vote, uh, uh, vote Yes for Water effort, and we are a political action committee that is uh, putting this on this evening. And uh, while well, John is on one of the committees, he is here for information only. John is uh, our mayor and uh, doing a fine job, in my opinion. But um, for him tonight, it will be information. That is his role this evening. Um, the Vote Yes for Water Committee is composed of six people, myself as chairman, Mayor Mulfeld, John Anderson, Heidi Van Eer, I never get it right, Everin, and David Weinstein with Trust for Public Lands, and D. Frankforth, Trust for Public Lands. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Alex Deekman. Diek he is with the Trust for Public Lands as a project manager for this particular project, and he is the one that uh, has worked its way through Washington to get find, find money for this cause, and also worked with Stoltz Land and Lumber and the Stoltz family to bring this to a possibility. The Vote Yes for Water effort is a group that feels very strongly about what we're trying to do with the 1% for water. And uh, we are a political action committee dedicated to the passage of the 1% for water. Well, not everyone may agree, agree with the mechanism. There are very few that disagree with the need to do this. There is some uh, people that think we might have done it a different way as far as the funding goes, but uh, this is the most efficient way, in my opinion, that uh, the city had to choose from. And with that, we'll start the information. We'll hold questions until the end of John's presentation. There will be a microphone that uh, people can step up and ask questions. And right over here, I was pointing in the wrong direction. I guess there's one right here, too. But um, without any further ado, most of you know him as our fearless leader, and his name is uh, uh, John Malfeld, our mayor. And former mayor and former mayor. They're all in the house tonight, the last 20 years, I was reminded. Um, thanks for coming uh, this evening, and what I'm going to provide this evening is a history on uh, this project. This has been a project that's been in the makings for about 18 months. Um, and strictly what I'm going to talk about is the information and the steps that we've taken leading up to uh, this evening and the city's, city council's recent decision to um, initiate a ballot measure or special election to help uh, fund this important project. And it's a very important to note our project partners, which include, of course, F.H. Stoltz Land and Lumber Company. We, we wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for their generosity over the last hundred years and their willingness to consider this option for the city, of course, Montana, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and, of course, the city of Whitefish, and, as Mike mentioned, uh, the Trust for Public Land, who could not be with us this evening. Um, many of you are very familiar with F.H. Stoltz Land and Lumber Company. They're obviously a very important uh, driver of our local economy. And over the past 100 years, Stoltz, as a neighborly accommodation, has provided the city of Whitefish access to the 3,000 acres of lands they own in Haskell Basin for the purpose of operating, maintaining, and delivering water from second and third creeks in Haskell Basin to our water treatment plant in, um, in uh, up Reservoir Road, just outside of the city. Um, in addition to that neighborly accommodation, they've obviously opened their lands as a neighborly accommodation for public access, recreation, as we're all very familiar with. Uh, the company's 100% family-owned, and they, they uh, employ about 100 um, employees um, in Columbia Falls. And one important point I wanted to make is Stoltz's commitment to sustainable forestry, because this is going to um, be a major component of the conservation easement if that is uh, finalized, which we certainly hope it is. Um, Stoltz, in my opinion, are excellent stewards of the land. Uh, they practice sustainable forestry, and one of their paramount goals over the last hundred years has been a commitment to protect the city's uh, water supply, again, as a neighborly accommodation. I think I should probably be flipping this, right? 
So again, as I mentioned, this has been about an 18-month uh, public process. Uh, for, you, for those of you that have followed the process, there's been about 48 media publications since 2013, consisting of both TV ads as well as newspaper and uh, media outreaches. Uh, we've held public open houses here at the O'Shaughnessy Center, as well as City Hall, and of course our City Council has held multiple uh, public hearings uh, dating back about one year. So we've had uh, quite a bit of public involvement through this process leading up to where we are uh, today. The lands we're talking about um, as part of this conservation easement are located again in the Haskell Basin watershed. And I'm just going to point out the area that we're referring to is outlined in this red border, including this 320 acre piece sandwiched between uh, this DNRC uh, piece. The city's water intakes are located, as I mentioned, in the Second Creek and Third Creek drainages of Haskell Basin. On this right uh, aerial oblique photo, uh, you have Second Creek and again Third Creek, the diversion points being located in the lower portion of the watershed. The city delivers uh, water through a two-mile buried pipeline noted in green on this map, again down to our water treatment plant. What this map also reflects is the adjacent developments that have occurred over the last 20 years, some of which have been occurring within our municipal watershed supply, including expansion of the Whitefish Resort Master Plan Area, the Lookout Ridge subdivision, and the Iron Horse uh, uh, community. So that's just a general map of the lands uh, we're talking about uh, this evening. What's interesting is when we started looking into this project, what became quite alarming to the city was the fact that despite uh, over 100 years of uh, using the Haskell Creek source as our municipal watershed uh, supply, uh, we have very limited legal rights to access the property, pipe water down from our diversions, and to even maintain our diversions. So that really was the primary impetus uh, for pursuing uh, this project uh, by the city of Whitefish. Specifically, what we don't have rights to, there are no legal easements for the water lines between First Creek, Second Creek, and Third Creek. There's no easement to maintain the diversion structures on Second Creek. The intake on Third Creek is not even owned by the city of Whitefish. And there's no easement of record providing the city legal access, again, to access the Salts lands for the operations and maintenance of these diversions. For those of you that haven't um, seen these before, these diversions, they're very simple structures. The upper left photo is the Second Creek diversion. It consists of three 18-inch radial head gates that are manually controlled by city personnel, our public works department. Uh, the water is diverted through a screen into the buried pipeline. And then the diversion on Third Creek in the lower right is essentially an on-stream concrete weir that again regulates the inflow of water to a second buried line that joins the second creek line and then ultimately the line that takes the water from both of these tributaries down to our water treatment plant about two miles. When you look at the development potential, which again is the biggest threat to the city's water supply, this property could be technically subdivided, subdivided into as many as 200 lots. Uh, we understand over the last 15 years, Stoltz has sold off approximately 1,200 acres of property to adjacent developments, as I mentioned, Whitefish Mountain Resort, Iron Horse, and the Lookout Ridge uh, subdivision for subdivision um, activity. And that's noted in this map, uh, the land use plans and the subdivision plots for these various um, properties that have been sold off and their relation to our water supply. So really, again, the impetus for the city has been to see if there would be a way to permanently protect these lands from development for the protection of our water supply. And we don't need to look far into the past uh, to see examples of how mismanaged watersheds can impact our city's water supply. Back in 1975, one of our primary diversion points was on First Creek which is adjacent to Second and Third Creek. And that specific diversion actually contributed more water to our treatment plant on an annual basis than the combined flows from Second and Third Creek. Unfortunately, due to development, 
um, and E. coli contamination from failing septic systems, sewage lagoons, and also sedimentation from upstream development, the city had to discontinue the First Creek uh, water supply diversion in, in 1975, and we have not been able to bring that water source online, nor will we be able to for a variety of different uh, physical and legal reasons. So what we, at, at the city level, we're trying to think about our municipal watershed supply and the infrastructure that delivers the water to our community as really a change in, in focus as to how we can harness that this watershed to provide many of the functions traditional infrastructure provide municipalities, such as water treatment plants. And we acknowledge that if we can maintain a healthy watershed, the watershed can in fact do a lot of the work for us. And this isn't an issue that just Whitefish is facing, but many communities across the country that derive their municipal watershed supply or water supply from forested watersheds are recognizing that these lands are at threat due to development, uh, insect and disease, and of course, wildfire. And this particular map is a map of the 10% uh, of the watersheds that are at risk uh, due to development, wildfire, and insect and disease throughout the country. And that's just a simple map, but again, we're not alone, and many communities are recognizing uh, the importance and the economic viability of protecting our, our of watersheds for the, the purpose of uh, clean water to communities. So one of the analyses that we ran is in a hypothetical, hypothetical situation, what would it cost if the city were to have to revert solely to drawing its water from Whitefish Lake? Currently, we derive about 75% of our water from the Haskell Basin. Um, during the summer, as flows diminish and the demand increases due to tourism activity and increasing you know, seasonal population, uh, we're forced to revert to lake water pumping. About 25% of the water comes from the lake. But what's interesting about that, or an important note, is the cost to actually deliver and treat the water from Whitefish Lake is much higher than the cost to gravity feed water from Haskell Basin down to our water treatment plant. And this is a very simple uh, table summarizing what those differences in costs would be based on different hypothetical scenarios where we have to revert to 33% lake water, 50% lake water, 67% lake water, or a lake only pumping scenario and treatment scenario. This table shows under our current operational uh, scheme, uh, we pay about, or you pay, about $712 per million gallons treated. Under a 50% scenario, that cost would increase from $712 to $1,267 per million gallons treated. And under a lake only scenario, that cost would increase from $712 to almost 18 or just over $1,800 uh, per million gallons treated. What this means is who's going to pay for that? Ultimately, the water users pay for that, you and me. And when you run the numbers of these different scenarios, assuming a lake water only scenario, our water users would be looking at a $500,000 increase in annual operational costs in perpetuity that translates to a roughly 20% increase in monthly water rates. That doesn't include the additional infrastructure needs that would be required to store that additional water. I don't know if many of you have been up to our water treatment plant, but the topography is very challenging. It's, it's steeper, and in order to expand the reservoir capacity under a lake water only scenario, we'd be looking at significant capital infrastructure costs to upgrade the reservoir, and ultimately that cost would be borne uh, by the city uh, water users and taxpayers. We also acknowledge through this process in the campaign committee that there's obviously ancillary benefits to this project. We acknowledge that this forms the, the view shed that um, is the backdrop to our community, uh, just below Whitefish Mountain Resort, and then transitioning to the Flathead National Forest, and of course the North Fork of uh, the Flathead River, the Wild and Scenic River. We also acknowledge that there's significant recreational and public access benefits that could be codified in perpetuity. And while the resort tax increase, if approved, would not necessarily pay for the recreational improvements, we've been evaluating uh, different opportunities to expand 
uh, recreation. In particular, uh, the Whitefish Trail system. As many of you know, the master plan for the Whitefish Trail contemplates a loop system that would, as we've completed up to the, t the north end of Whitefish Lake last year, the Beaver Lakes easement and trail system, that trail system ultimately will link into Taylor Creek and ultimately up to uh, Whitefish Mountain Resort or in proximity to Whitefish Mountain Resort. And then again, that critical loop to close it back to the Wisconsin Avenue bike trail requires another permanent easement. And these lands that we're negotiating and part of this conservation easement will include uh, an easement for the city to, in the future, construct this critical linkage between ultimately what will be the connection at Whitefish Mountain Resort uh, down to uh, the water treatment plant or adjacent to it on Reservoir Road. In addition, as many of you know, there's currently grooming that occurs, you know, in the Haskell Basin watershed that serves a, a fairly minor few that have access to actually access the trails that are groomed. As part of this conservation easement, we're also working and negotiating with Stoltz on providing permanent public winter recreational opportunities, which may and probably will include not only cross-country skiing, but Nordic uh, skiing opportunities as part of the easement as well. And we, you've probably heard around town, this is truly a one-shot deal. And I want to touch on exactly why this, in our opinion, is a one-shot deal. Uh, number one, the easement that's been negotiated between the Trust for Public Land and Stoltz has a, a right to purchase through the end of 2015. So we're on a pretty fast timeline, as I'm sure you've picked up on. Um, again, the benefits that we will realize from this project include prohibiting subdivision development, the city, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks won't be purchasing the land. We're simply purchasing the development rights off of the property or from the property. So Stoltz will continue to maintain uh, their timber operations, their sustainable forest management practices, as they've demonstrated they've done so well over the past 100 years. Um, I've touched on quite a bit regarding the city's primary water supply and the benefits we'll realize from that, but this easement also in perpetuity guarantees permanent public access uh, for our residents. Through this process, there's been fit various folks who've asked, well, aren't there alternatives to surface water? Do we have to pay for this? Do we need to keep uh, Haskell Basin as our primary water source? And the answer to that question is very simple. It's yes. Back in the 1990s, the city evaluated groundwater wells as an alternative to surface water. And we tapped a bunch of groundwater exploration wells throughout town, various locations. And what we found um, in the chemistry of the water is that there's a high presence of manganese and iron that would require significant treatment and softening in addition to the cost to actually pump from the valley floor back up to the water treatment plant to where it would then be treated and then redistributed to its users. Um, during that process, uh, when we did our test, our, draw, our drawdown test, what we, showed, what we saw in the actual well logs was significant drawdown of adjacent domestic wells. So we were impacting existing domestic wells, in particular at the wellhead locations on East uh, Edgewood Drive at the intersection of 2nd Street and Edgewood. So uh, recognizing the impacts to adjacent wells, the high cost for additional treatment, and pumping, the consultants at that time indicated that relying on Haskell Creek as our primary water support supply would be the, obviously in the city's best interest as a long-term solution. So in 1998, the city um, upgraded its plant at the cost of about $4.8 million, and we built our new water uh, treatment plant up on Reservoir Road. At the same time, we also acquired additional uh, water rights uh, from Whitefish Lake. One of the big questions is how much is this project going to cost? Uh, the conservation easement, which was appraised about two years ago, was valued at approximately $20.6 million. Again, that's just the cost to purchase the development rights. Uh, Stoltz has offered to sell the easement for a discounted rate of or price of $17 uh, million. Where will the money come from? Um, over the past two years, the Trust for Public Land, I give them all the credit for the money that's been brought to the table to, to make this project an actual reality for the city. They applied for and received a $7 million uh, grant from the U.S. Forest Service Forest Legacy Program. That's, this project 
competed nationally and ranked as the president's number one top priority for funding in 2014. They also applied for and received $2 million from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Habitat Conservation Plan Acquisition Program for a total of $9 million in federal funding. I mentioned the additional $4 million, which was discounted by Stoltz, leaving the balance for our community at roughly $8 million. So from my perspective, as Mike Jensen's pointed out in the past, and Steve Lull, we're looking at a $20.6 million project, and we're asking our community to come up with $8 million. It's about a 38 cent on a dollar deal for the city of Whitefish, and I think that's a pretty darn good deal. How we fund this on the local level obviously became the big question. And part of the services that the Trust for Public Land provides is they can look at different conservation options that are available uh, to communities such as ours to help you know, close the gap on projects like this. We evaluated a variety of options from general obligation bonds to an increase in the resort tax to water revenue bonds, um, water rate increases, and even philanthropy. And we studied that and the Trust for Public Land produced a conservation finance feasibility study that was presented to the Whitefish City Council in a public hearing in 2013 or 14, I forget what date that actually was. And so I wanna just quickly go through what these different options looked like from a financial standpoint because ultimately this analysis led to the council's decision to pursue um, a special election to increase the resort tax from 2% to 3% for a 10-year period because they felt it was the most equitable option to spread the burden among, among not only our residents but also the folks that come visit our town. A water revenue bond is essentially a water rate increase and can be voted on and approved by the majority of the city council during a public hearing. It does not require the vote of the people. I'm going to go through this really quickly, but we looked at what the cost would be or the cost increase would be over both the 10-year bond cycle and a 30-year bond cycle, again, with uh, an $8 million uh, net funds uh, required. Uh, looking at the percent increase in water rates on a 10-year bond, we'd be roughly at 47%, a 30-year bond, 17%. Uh, we looked at an average residence, meaning an average residence that consumes about 4,300 gallons per month in water. Some consume a lot more, some consume a lot less. The increase per year on a 10-year bond would be approximately $220 per residence, or on a 30-year bond, roughly $80.64. Um, over the total life of the bond, on a 10-year bond, that average resident would pay roughly $2,200 on a 30-year bond cycle, approximately $2,400. We also looked at what that impact would be on an average commercial property in town. And when I say average, that includes motels, hospitals, even offices and retailers in the downtown. Again, starting with the same net fund needed of $8 million and the same percent increase in water rates, when we look at all commercial properties, the increase per year on a 10-year bond would be approximately $900, and on a 30-year bond, roughly $330, uh, resulting in about $9,000 over a 10-year bond cycle, and under a 30-year bond cycle, close to $10,000 per commercial property. The other analysis we looked at was the impact on restaurants, acknowledging that restaurants are probably our largest consumers. Um, looking at this uh, hypothetical model, uh, the same uh, percent increase in water rates would apply, the same net funds required. Um, on a 10-year note, it would be approximately $1,350 for an average restaurant, and under a 30-year bond, approximately $500 uh, per year. Uh, that translates over a 10-year period to approximately $13,500 and under a 30-year note, uh, about the same amount or, or roughly $15,000. And that includes the average of all restaurants. Some obviously consume a lot more, some less. Option two, which was included in the finance study, was a general obligation bond, which would require uh, the approval of uh, Whitefish uh, voters. Um, 
again, the same numbers. And when we look at the total cost for the issuance of the bonds plus the bond debt service, um, essentially what we're looking at is an increase um, in the number of mills on your property tax bill of approximately 23 mills on a 20-year bond and roughly 41 mills on a 10-year bond. That's approximately a 4% increase in property taxes on a 10-year note or 7.5% on a 10, excuse me, on a 20-year bond and about 7.4% on a 10-year bond over those life cycles. Uh, the average taxpayer in town would assume an additional tax burden of approximately $2,000 on a 20-year note and on a 10-year note or bond cycle approximately $1,800, again requiring uh, voter approval. Which brings us to our third option, which I know many of you are familiar with, is the resort tax. And under the resort tax option, our current resort tax um, expires or requires voter extension by 2025. I believe it's June 30th, 2025, when the current 2% resort tax either expires or needs to be um, extended by a vote of the people. We looked at what a 1% increase in resort tax revenues would generate over a 10-year bond cycle, assuming 5% growth in the resort tax. And we base that on a, a basement level or a basement uh, revenue of approximately $1,050,000, which was our total gross revenues uh, for 1% in 2014. Under this resort tax scenario, similar to our current 2%, we would agree to rebate back to property owners in town, and that's people that own homes, vacant land, and commercial properties, 25% of the total revenues collected over the life of this 10-year uh, cycle. That total uh, cost would be approximately, or that total rebate to taxpayers in Whitefish would be about $3.6 million over the 10-year period. And what's important to note here is this, this third line, the revenue needed for the 10-year loan using a state revol revolving fund at 2.5%, which is a fixed interest rate. You can see over the, 10, the first year, or the 10-year, and then year nine, the total revenues collected would be approximately $9.9 .9 million. And that revenue after the property tax rebate and after the payments for the loan results in a, a net of about $261,000 after 10 years. And the reason I bring that up is because there has been discussion in this town about, well, can we allocate a portion of this 1% to some other need in this community? We looked at that in earnest, and what we found is, given our $8 million requirement, the issuance costs and the debt service, we barely pencil at year 10 to pay for, the one, to pay for this project as a standalone project in our town. So what does this mean to an average homeowner? Um, I mentioned about $3.6 million in additional tax relief over 10 years. Uh, current residents in that residential, that average residence is uh, valued at about a $275,000 home, receives about a $126 uh, rebate per year on their property tax bill. Raising the resort tax to 3% will rebate an additional 50% in addition to what's also rebated for about an additional $63 per year. Uh, that would increase their total rebate on an average home from $126 per year to $189 per year. And there's been questions also about, well, you're assuming 5% growth. What if the resort tax doesn't grow at 5%? What are you going to do? We looked at the history of the resort tax since it was enacted, and the resort tax has yielded an average return of about 6.13% uh, since inception with a range from 5.2 all the way up to 10.3%. And in fact, our December 2014 uh, resort tax uh, revenues were up 13% compared to December 2013 numbers. And this is just a general chart of those different collections. And as you're familiar, uh, the resort tax applies to motels, bars and restaurants, and then what we consider luxury items uh, for retail. And when you look at the total collections over the last 17 years, uh, retail is comprised about 45% of the total collections. Bars and restaurants, 37%, and motels, approximately 18%. Again, with that, that average increase of 6.1% over uh, the life of the resort tax. 
So after all this information, I know it's a lot to digest tonight, but after all this information was presented to the city council in a work session, uh, the city um, directed the Trust for Public Land uh, to retain Fairbanks, Maslin, Mullen, and Metz out of California. It's a public polling uh, firm that does public polling uh, throughout uh, the country. And what we felt at the council level, based on public input that was provided, was that we felt the most equitable means to help distribute the burden of this project to not only our residents, but also the folks that come visit, because they're using our water as well. And what's the appetite in town for a resort tax increase to help pay for this project? So we tested uh, that question. And in January 2015, just a couple months ago, uh, FM3, which stands for the company that did the polling, uh, contacted about 175 um, folks in Whitefish. And the question they asked is on the screen. And I don't think I'm gonna essentially read it, but they basically asked to protect and preserve the water quality and quantity, including the source water supply for the city of Whitefish. Uh, shall the resort tax be raised and amended from 2% to 3% effective July 1st, 2015 and ending January 31st, 2025? with the revenues resulting from the 1% rate increase being used as follows. I mentioned the 25% property tax relief, 70% of the revenue to be pledged to the repayment of the loan or bond to finance this project, and then 5% is retained with the merchants to pay for their cost for administration. So that question was asked to the folks that were uh, polled uh, within the city this past January. After learning just a little bit about this project, and, um, they were asked the question, if the vote on this measure were held today, would you vote in yes or would you oppose this? And the initial response that we received was approximately 30% definitely yes, probably yes, 27%, and undecided but leaning yes totaled approximately 61% of the folks that were polled. Those that said adamantly, no was probably 12%, definitely no, 19% for a total percentage of about 32% of the people polled indicating they would not support uh, this method for financing the project. When asked in a few words, why would you vote to approve this project or this ballot proposition, over 58% of the respondents or individuals polled indicated to protect the watershed, to provide for clean water and for water quality. Um, Moving on, a majority of the no voters um, simply are opposed to raising taxes and two in 10 or about 20% of the folks polled didn't believe that the funds raised would be used as promised. So again, 54% of those that were polled indicating no, they wouldn't support this indicated that they were just generally against raising taxes. When asked the question, would raising the city of Whitefish resort tax hurt our economy and drive business and customers to Kalispell, 29% uh, strongly agreed, 68% disagreed, indicating raising the resort tax 1% would not have an impact on our local economy. When asked about alternative funding sources, um, we indicated in the question, the final source of funding for this measure has not been determined and we asked or we listed a couple different options which I've gone over tonight, one being raising property taxes by 4.3%. 85% of the respondents indicated no, 13% indicated yes, we'd consider that. What about raising water rates 23%? 75% of the respondents said no. What about raising property taxes by 4%? 74% of the respondents indicated no. Pretty compelling information from a very statistically uh, valid poll that was conducted in January. After the series of questions were asked of those that were polled, they learned a lot more information about the project. So that same question that was asked at the beginning of the poll was again asked. If the vote on this measure were held today, would you vote yes in favor or no to oppose it? At the end of the 20 minute interview, 71% indicated yes, they would support an increase in the resort tax. That's up from 61% during the initial question at the beginning of the poll. Um, 
total no actually decreased from 32% at the beginning of the poll uh, to 26%. So really strong uh, values that uh, we were presented by FM3 in the Trust for Public Land, which ultimately, uh, I'm not gonna go over the polling conclusions because I think I've covered those. What ultimately that information uh, provided the city council or directed the city council was a resolution that was held during a public hearing on February 17th to consider um, a special election to increase the resort tax from 2% to 3% to fund this conservation easement. And that was passed uh, by the city council uh, via resolution 15-04. Ultimately, what this means is it's going to be a mail-in ballot uh, ballots are going to be mailed on April 8th, and the election will be April 28th. Um, what I've included on this slide is the ballot language that folks will actually receive in the mail. And the reason I wanted to read this tonight and post this tonight is because the language can be confusing, and it's, it's not a very simple ballot question. Uh, it had to go through bond counsel, legal counsel, uh, before it was finalized. So in case there's any questions or if this language is confusing, I wanted to present this tonight to give you an opportunity to ask questions about the ballot language or, or, or the measure language. So I'm going to read this uh, very quickly because this is what you're going to be reading when you receive your ballot. To protect and preserve water quality and quantity, including the source drinking water supply for the municipal water system of the city of Whitefish through the acquisition of a conservation easement or other interests in and around Haskell Basin, shall the existing resort tax rate be amended from 2% to 3% effective July 1st, 2015 and ending on January 31st, 2025, with resort tax revenues resulting from the 1% rate increase to be used as follows. Number one, 25% for property tax relief that it is in addition to the existing property tax relief. 70% to secure and be pledged the repayment of a loan or a bond to finance a portion of the costs or to otherwise pay for the acquisition of the conservation easement or other interests except that if such portion of resort tax revenues received in a fiscal year is more than is needed in that fiscal year for such loan or bond, the excess will be applied to additional property tax relief in the next fiscal year. And third, the merchant's retention of 5% for their costs for administration. So a very lengthy question, but at the end of the day, what you're gonna be asked is, are you for this amendment? Are you against this amendment? And my reason for being here tonight certainly isn't to tell you how to, how to vote on this measure. It's simply to inform you about the steps we've taken to get to this critical juncture in this decision-making process for our community. Um, we, as a community, consistently set a high bar for ourselves. And I think we can reach this goal. Um, we ask the voters to think about this project, um, think about the best way to pay for this project, because it is important. It is something we do need to get done. And I hope the information that I've presented tonight is, is helpful and will help you make an informed decision when you do cast your ballot in April. And I hope that you do vote one way or another. Please cast your ballot. And with that said, uh, thanks for your attention. I hope that wasn't too lengthy. I said 40 minutes. I think it was 37. So we're doing pretty good. <laughs> and I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, actually, I meant to mention this. Just, yeah. Hi, my, my name is Jack Garlitz, and I live uh, up in Haskell Basin, and the Stoltz surrounds me. They're the best neighbors in the world. You're all lucky to have them. However, I object to the way you want to fund this. Uh, it's a noble project, and it should be done. But I don't think we ought to raise a resort tax. 
The people that live in Whitefish ought to pay for their own water. Us people that live out of the city, we have approximately $50 a month increase in our electric bills running pumps. Every year we have to have filter systems cleaned at another $300 plus. We pay for our own water. We don't do it on the backs of tourists. Uh, the tourists are already paying 2%. You need a new city hall. Where's that money going to come from? You know, it's just some things to think about. I don't believe it ought to be a resort tax. The people that use the water ought to pay for it. Now, I come to town, I eat in a restaurant. I'm going to pay for higher meals. I know that. They're going to pass the increase to me. Do I want to walk with my feet and go to Columbia Falls to eat? No, I don't really want to, but I might have to. Thank you. Thanks, John. Just in, in response to the one question about how we're paying for City Hall, that's being funded through uh, tax increment financing, uh, the commercial component of our TIF, so it's, it's not property taxes. There will be no additional property taxes levied to build um, City Hall. And John, I, I understand your point regarding not wanting to pay the additional 1%. I guess from the City Council's perspective, they felt that why burden the 5,200 households in town with the full cost of this project when we could spread the burden to 500,000 people that elect to come to our community and use our water as well. And I think that was the general um, consensus of the council and the philosophy behind that decision. But I, I appreciate your, your comments. Who's next? Wow. Okay. Hi, I'm Christine Rossi. I'm just, just because I don't know exactly what the 2% currently funds as far as programs, is there any risk to what it's currently funding if the majority is going to pay back for the loan? The, the current 2%, 65%, which was approved 17 years ago, 65% of the current 2% goes towards um, street and infrastructure. 25% goes towards property tax relief. 5% goes to parks, and 5% is retained by the merchants for their administrative costs. So that's the, the 2%. The additional 1% is separate. It'll be um, accounted for separately to, for the debt service, for the conservation easement, plus the 25% additional property tax, plus the 5%. So it will not affect how the current 2% is allocated and used. Great question. Any other questions? Can't let me off this easy. Yep. You bet. No, oh, sure. It's quite lengthy. Jake, the microphone, please. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, a few. Hi, I'm Matt Magstad. Uh, I just have a question on access to this this spot that we're we're going to get the easement on. Now I understand we're not going to own the deed on this, right? Correct. So um, I guess again, access. How do we have access to this? The the city will be co-owner and co-grantee on the easement with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks with Stoltz. Um, access is going to be current access will be maintained. Stoltz retains the right to provide the same level of access to the public as they always have. What we've discussed as a community is that one dedicated trailhead down the road um, that would begin at the water treatment plant and be a limited uh, easement connecting to Big Mountain. Um, dispersed recreation, dispersed access would continue as it has uh, for the past you know, 100 years. Um, on the east side of the property, there's been some discussion about perhaps enhancing a parking area or developing a parking area just to try to limit uh, how dispersed the recreational you know, access is on the east side of the property. And that's about it. And so they control the timber still? They're still going to control the timber? Absolutely. And, and, yep. and, and mine it in the same way that they, they have for years, or farm it, I'm sorry. 
Yes, as part of the conservation easement, there'll be a resource management plan uh, that basically spells out all of Stoltz's um, responsibilities and rights to continue with sustainable forest management in the same manner they have for the last 75 to 100 years. Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the meeting and, and I apologize for that. So, Whitefish in 1998 um, put a bond up and we built a bigger, better water treatment plant up there and we had no right to the water above it or we had no... At the time, we did not codify the legal rights to that water, you're correct. Wow, okay. I guess we're making up for past mistakes. All right, that, thanks. That was my reaction when I learned the same. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Jim Limbaugh. Uh, just a question, and this has been sort of like preaching in the choir because I think a lot of folks believe this is a good thing, but I'm curious. What happens on election day if it goes the other way and it's not voted in? You talked about some of the issues about water access. What do you all do if you don't get it the way you want it? Well, we're putting it out to the voters and what they want, I guess, to clarify. You know, they'll either vote this in or they'll vote it out. And at that point, the council has two options or three options. One is do nothing, no action. Second option is go out for a general obligation bond to pay for this, which requires the vote of the people. So another special election. Or the third option is a water revenue bond or essentially the vote of the council to increase water rates by 20%. Those are the three options that we, we have in our back pockets. So. Hi, Jen Schutz here. You mentioned First Creek the, that had supplied more water than Second and Third Creek combined. There was E. coli issues and there was sedimentation issues. Are there any, you said there was reasons why the, that could not be uh, ameliorated or fixed. Can you expand on that? Our city manager is here, Chuck Stearns, and just because it's a water rights issue that he's been dealing with, I may let him answer that question. Sure, that's a good question. Um, there's some legal water rights uses that when you stop using the water for a certain period of time, you can use your, lose your water rights to that. So uh, a Western water doctrine is use it or lose it. Now, that's just one aspect about it. The whole Haskell Basin and all the watersheds around the state have been adjudicated or determined the amount of water rights that everybody has and basically they set our water rights well everybody statewide at the amount you were using in 1975 and so out of first second or third creek we can only obtain what we were using in 1975 from those sources and then beyond that we have additional water rights pumping out of the lake so even if we could overcome the first issue of use it or lose it and put first wa creek water back into use, we'd still be limited to the amount that we were using in 1975 under the 1972 constitutional, uh, new constitution of Montana. So there's those two fairly legal aspects that prevent us from using it. Thanks, Chuck. Who's next? Further questions? Matt. So, so we have a water rights award. So we have our uh, water rights figured out, um, as Chuck just talked about. But what what are we trying? What are we talking about when we're saying rights to the diversions and the land itself? What what are we securing with this easement that way? Basically, the legal right to enter the property, drive to the diversions to operate and maintain those diversions, plus the easement, the, the physical easement of the buried water line from Second and Third Creeks down to the treatment plant, as well as uh, the easement for uh, the actual uh, and ownership of those actual diversion points. 
I don't know if Chuck, did you want to add to that at all? But essentially, those are the legal rights that we'll codify uh, with this easement. Okay, so, so up until now, it's just been a handshake. just been allowed to do it. Handshake deal. Yep. I think there's a, this something I read years ago, and I think we were the city fathers were offered to purchase the land on the Second Creek diversion back in 1918 for, I believe, seven dollars, and they declined. Further questions? Yeah, but John, that's $80 in today's value. That's right, Steve. <laughs> Any other questions tonight? Well, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming. I know it's a lot of information to digest, and there'll be obviously more information, and I'm going to let Mike say a few words and kind of close out the evening for us. Thanks. I have a couple things I wanted to say, but just to touch on the last point that happened when uh, we were talking about what was asked and not paid for in 1918. 50 years from now, see, I can do this. I can promote this. I'm the chairman of the fort. So 50 years from now, nobody's going to care who did what, when, and they aren't going to care how it happened, but they're going to turn around and say, you got that for $8 million? That's incredible. So I believe that it's very much in our interest to do this. And uh, beyond information, I will do everything I can to promote it. Uh, a couple other people I wanted to acknowledge. We have, uh, uh, with the committee, uh, Vote Yes for Water committee, Fred Lull has been tireless in his efforts to raise money to fund this campaign. And I would like a round of applause for him and Kristen Bodine. Kristen Bodine has helped him immeasurably. Who did I say? Did I say Steve Law? Oh, well, Fred's coming up. Pardon me, Steve, I'm sorry. Fred Jones is our treasurer and has been keeping our money straight, so I'd like a round of applause for Fred, too. With that, we do have an office, and it's on 2nd Street as you come into town across from the uh, music school. And we uh, would appreciate anyone willing to volunteer with the committee to, uh, as a volunteer to help pass this measure, to uh, stop by the office and let them know. Um, and it is at 419 Spokane Avenue. And you can also call the office at 890 8920 or our website protectwhitefishwater.org any other issues questions thoughts thank you very much for uh, John's got one more comment here how about a round of applause for our chairman Mike Jensen when we were sitting around the, the table after the council approved the resolution, we were scratching our heads, well, who's going to chair this thing? Well, it's definitely not going to be me. But Mike's in New Zealand, and he gladly volunteers. <laughs> so Mike stepped off the plane after a six-week fly fishing trip in New Zealand and assumed the chairman position. So um, certainly appreciate that, Mike. Thanks for everything you're doing as well. So, thanks, everyone. <laughs>